Hi and welcome to JWork Studio. My name is Jörg. Today's video is about setting up X, Y and Z zero. Very simple to do once you get a little bit down the road and using your machine as a beginner, not so easy. So in this video, which is actually pretty long and dry, I have everything in there from the very beginner all the way to the pro tips for setting up a more automated system. So here you see the home screen of adding CNC. And I'd like to show you one thing that is really, really important. And that is that there are two coordinate systems on every CNC machine. One is the machine coordinate system. This is shown up here in green right now. And one is the work coordinate system. The one that we work most with and we are familiar with is the work coordinate system. We come back later to this. Uh, there are more, is more than one, but important is right now that we also have some machine coordinate system. And it does not matter what machine you have. It can be a Haas, a Tormach, a Lace, or a Mill, a 5-axis machine, or a CNC router that runs on adding CNC, or on Linux CNC, or a Gerbil. It does not matter. We have always a machine coordinate system. So this machine coordinate system will receive its information of every axis when we home the machine. So the first thing that I have to do starting out when I turn my machine on is to home it. And I'm going to do that right now. So let's do that pretty quick. All I have to do is uh, on my pendant actually function and home the machine. And there it goes. So now the machine coordinate system is applied, it's set to zero and the machine knows in its axis where it stands. So the machine sits right now at 10, 10 minus five relative to its zero on the axis. And that is its absolute position. We don't work with these coordinates. We work with the work coordinate system. Often you see that also abbreviated as WC. S work coordinate system. That is shown here as blue and here is just some numbers in here that is from my last job. Adding CNC keeps these numbers. Well where are they coming from? Next thing is well, I would like to set it to zero. So how do I know where to find zero on my workpiece? Well if you made the file for it that is probably then very simple to answer because you know from top of your head where the workpiece coordinate system is. So where zero is. In this instance here is Infusion. I made a block that I want to face. And if I activate this toolpath right here, you see that on the middle of the screen here, we have X, Y, and Z zero right here on the top left-hand side of my workpiece. So top left-hand side. In VCarve, that looks a little different. So if I go over to VCarve Pro, you see here a carving that I have in the left-hand side is a job setup. If I go now to the 2D view, here's a red dot. And this is where my zero point is for the work coordinate system. We see here Z0 is on the material surface. And VCARF calls it the X, Y datum position. And that is in the center of my workpiece in this case. So you already see it's not always the same. We don't have to have it always in the front left. There are sometimes advantages to choose it in a strategic good position, especially if you batch out more than one part. Okay, so here comes tip number one. Whenever I need precision in a part, especially when I make metal parts and the outside dimension is already finished and I take the part off and go back to it, I need to make two holes in this part right here and these need to be dimensionally precise. Then I pick the corner of the part for X and Y. Now, if I'm doing woodworking where, you know, if this butterfly right here would be off by a 30 second of an inch in either direction, you would never see it. I just mark pretty quick the center of the board and then set up my zero point right there. I do that, of course, already in the G-code. And it's especially helpful if you go to a larger board. You see the center position doesn't change. Or here I have a plaque where, you know, maybe a corner is cut off or you already have a shape on the outside that is difficult to pick a position from, then going to the center and making the center your x, y, zero is so much easier and faster. The most common way to zero out x and y 
is a manual method and you're probably gonna learn that when you start out because there are other gizmos that we can use but in the beginning you might just have to do it by hand. So let's do that together. I'm going to drive the tool over and also a little bit further back. So I know that I'm behind the workpiece now, I'm cut down and I'm using the dial on my pendant right now to do this job. And I have the step size set to one millimeter. And that is very, very important right now. Look what happens if I move one millimeter. That is a really big step. So I'm coming closer to my workpiece and here I'm turning one cutting edge out. So one cutting edge is facing directly towards the workpiece. And in Z, I need to go down a little further. And now I come over in X, one more, one more. And I'm afraid if I would do one more click, I would already touch the part, be in the part and break the edge of the tool. So now I go to 0.1 millimeter. Very, very important step here. We go to now a step size of 0.1 millimeter. And now we can come over and I'm getting as close as I can to the part there. And now what I'm start doing is I will go in here with my hand and turn the cutting edge away. One more, turn it back in. One more, turn it back in. And I do that until I touch the part. Now I'm, there it is right there, I can feel it. So this is now my position hold on and minus the radius of the tool. In this case here, it's a 10 millimeter tool. So we are going to be at minus five right now for the center of the spindle. So I've touched off the Y axis in this direction the same way. And now we are ready to touch off Z. I've positioned the tool right over my workpiece. And I'm using a paper shim right here. I measured that paper shim. It is 0.1 millimeter thick. This is regular printer paper. And I'm gonna lay that on top of my workpiece like so. And I'm now lowering the Z axis down. So the tool directly onto the paper. And important now is that we don't drive the cutting edge into our material. So I have now selected a step distance of one millimeter and I'm coming down onto the workpiece. And once I'm getting close, I will just go ahead and change, maybe one more, there it is. Now I'm gonna to change to a step distance of 0.1. So 0.1 and um, I'm gonna lay my pendant like right here next to it. You probably cannot see it, but important is that you now take the shim stock and start wiggling it under the tool, point one. And at one point of time, it's going to pinch that paper. And when we have achieved that, then we can discuss of how far is it that our tool is now away from the surface. So here I can feel it now. The next one is gonna probably, here it is, it grabs it right here. And this is our Z0 position. Well, let's discuss it for a moment. It would be Z0 if we are directly on. If I pinch the paper, it's probably not 0.1 millimeter like I have written on here, it's probably less. So I'm going to enter here 0.08, so 8 hundredths of a millimeter. And that has for me been a good value. And that is what I'm going to enter in my DRO. So here comes tip number two and three. If you're coming from a manual machining background, then you might know this wobbler. Um, it's a touch off tool to find zero in X and Y direction. And it does not work on a CNC router because the spindle goes too fast. Or in other words, this thing can run up to 800 RPM and our spindle doesn't go that slow. It can burn up. The next one is that you saw me use a piece of paper to find Z0. And I like that because it's a soft piece between the cutting edge and your material surface. If you have a piece of steel and you zero out and the break distance of your machine is too large, then you can break the edge of the tool, especially nowadays because we all use carbide tools. 
way back when we had HSS tools, they're a bit more forgiving, but those carbide tools are so brittle, they break right off. And that is the reason why I do not recommend you use a feeler gauge. Yes, it is a known thickness, but it's a hard surface that the tool sets onto and you can break the edge. So for the hobbyist, there's a popular item to find the zero and that is a simple touch plate. The touch plate itself makes contact between the tool and the plate that you put on your workpiece. And then in the moment the contact is made, the controller knows, hey, here is the zero. So you can make your own plate uh, if you like, and I recommend you make it from a simple copper sheet or use a PCB board that you attach a crocodile stamp clamp to it and a wire, solder it on. Now, also be careful if you have a spindle that has uh, ceramic bearings, then the uh, rotor usually doesn't have a ground. So you cannot pass that ground signal through. You have to attach it uh, to the tool itself. Okay. Next, I'd like to show you this gauge right here. It is made by Charles. You can get it off the Charles webpage, but also um, you find it on Amazon. I'm gonna leave you a link below. So this block is um, 50 millimeter tall. And the nice thing about this is that you have a little bit of give actually past the zero point. So if you are not like right on or you're going past a little bit, you're not going onto a hard surface ramming that fine edge into a ground hardened steel plate, but there is give behind it. I really, really like this tool. I have it for a long time. I find it also to be very precise. So this is something I can really recommend if you're starting out and you wanted to invest into something to make the tool changes easier and disease offset easier, this is the one to get. So my absolute preferred method of finding Z0 are these active tool length sensors. And it's a touch probe that will be placed on your table to measure the tool lengths and then it goes onto your workpiece. So let's say that white plate that is uh, up here is your workpiece, you're gonna set it on it and then it's gonna zero out again right there. And it has now its tool lengths and Z0. What is really cool about that is that all subsequent tool changes do not require any more another touch off on the workpiece. The machine is going automatically to my tool length sensor that sits right here in a pre-programmed position, touches off, and then it's gonna start machining. So it automize, automates a little bit the tool change itself. Um, I really like that. Next to it I like is that they are very precise. So you get a good repeatability using those if you get a quality one. Now, if you want this one, no problem. You can make your own by downloading the plans of my website, or if they're in stock, you can buy them in my web shop. Plug, plug. <laughs> so a bit more advanced is this 3D touch sensor right here. It's a 3D probe and it has a stylus and a USB connection. This one here is made by PG Fun, or that is a distributor actually. And I have a whole video about this on my playlist. I really like this. However, it is almost like another tool change because you have to put it in the spindle, touch X, Y, and then take it back out and then put your tool in. So um, the macro for using these is also something a bit advanced. So for a beginner, you probably wouldn't choose this. However, if you have a machine for a while and feel confident, I think this is an awesome addition. I'm gonna leave you a link for the updated one in the description. This would be an NPN with a normally closed circuit. And um, anyways, have a look at it. Not expensive. What I like about this one here is its overall heights is really suited very well for a CNC router. Another one a bit more advanced is to optically set X and Y. Um, if you look close, there's actually a black box right, sitting right there and that is an HD webcam that I placed there via USB and my controller supports it. Uh, let me show you how that works. So we're back at the editing screen and down here at F8, I have the graph and functions view. And here on the left-hand side is a camera sign. And when I activate that, I get the webcam coming up. 
And I have here a workpiece set up right here. It's an aluminum plate. The carbon fiber plate here is only there because to give you a little bit of contrast so that you can see that a bit more uh, on the camera because the hair cross that I have here, um, the center cross is very, very small. And so that we can see that better, I put the black behind it. Let's move X to the corner of the workpiece. And that would be maybe right, I would say about right there, maybe one more, there it is. And then let's move Y also onto that corner. And I would say that's about right there. I would leave it right there. And now when I exit out of this menu right here and close this window, then adding will automatically apply here on the top right hand side, you see it. Adding will automatically apply the offset from the camera to the zero point. I had this zeroed out a minute ago already. And I'd like to show you now how good I was in repeating this position. On X, we were dead on, zero, zero, but in Y, I'm off by 0.2 millimeters. And I understand that it is that there are no digits in the hundreds or thousands because my step was set to 0.1. So we would always see a full number here. All right. Um, yeah, actually 0.2 millimeter, that's pretty good. This whole setup is still a prototype though. Well, because you made it all the way to the end, I have one more tip. And that is how about not setting X and Y any more up at all? After you set it up once, you write down the machine coordinates. In the beginning, we discussed that those do not change. And coming right off the homing, if your workpiece is for the next job in the same position on your table, because you index it in, then you can go to the coordinates that you wrote down of the machine coordinates, of the machine coordinate system, and you go right back to X and Y zero. All right, that's going to be it for today. Please leave me a like and I'm going to catch you in the next one. Take care. Bye.